Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another lecture of E102. So, of course, you have homework number five due on Friday for 1% extra credit. There's a no questions asked extension up until Sunday, May 17th. As always, all times are 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. So we had a very exciting office hours today. We went over some of the homework problems. We gave the answers out to one of them. So I'll, in the interest of fairness, I'll go and review that same problem at the end of this lecture. All right, in the last lecture, we talked about the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform takes this form, uh, capital F, right? The frequency domain content is in the capital F in the Fourier domain or frequency domain. So this is kind of the Fourier domain is always capital F. It's one way to remember it. Uh, it's a projection. When we say a projection, it's like an inner product of your function f of t with the complex exponential. Okay. Uh, then we talked about the inverse Fourier transform, which has this constant of 1 over 2 pi and a swap in the sign. Okay. Here it's positive. And we showed a few computations. We did a couple of simple functions like rect, for example. We took a rect function and then we took a causal exponential and we showed that we could compute by hand the Fourier transform by taking these integrals. So that gave us these two transforms that we now know. The rect of t over t, capital T, uh, has a Fourier transform of a sink and the causal exponential has a Fourier transform of 1 over a plus j omega. So in general, uh, the TAs will walk you through a couple other Fourier transforms. You'll do more on your homework. We'll also cover another one today. Uh, I think one that we'll cover is we'll cover rect of t, for example, and we'll cover what that Fourier transform is by the end of the lecture. So you'll eventually have a table of Fourier transform pairs that you can handily refer to. Okay, so in general, we have this a uh, pretty complicated equation for the Fourier transform, right? We have capital F of j omega equals integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of t e to the uh, minus j omega t. So we had some equation that, that looks something like this. And um, in this uh, particular example, what we can also do is we can just write this in shorthand, right? If you think about f of t right here as being our input to the Fourier transform, we could just simply write this as an operator, which we kind of have this script notation. Um, and this operator uh, takes in f of t. And so that's shown right here. So uh, an operator or what's called a functional, it doesn't take in like a scalar, like a parameter, like independent variable, like time as an input. It takes another signal as an input, all right? So you can almost think of this capital F as a system itself, uh, if you remember our earlier designation of signals and systems. Uh, I guess the take home point here for today's slide is that these uh, operators, capital F and capital F inverse for the inverse Fourier transform, are a lot more convenient to write in shorthand than writing the full integral form sometimes. So just like we had that shorthand symbol for convolution, right, which was also an integral transform, here we can instead use this uh, script F, all right? And I'll try to be good with the handwriting to really write it like that as opposed to that, right? So these two are not equal. This is the operator. And this is just the this is just another signal in the Fourier array. It's the frequency response, which is actually a signal. All right. So in general, uh, there are these Fourier symmetries that we also have uh, when we talk about Fourier transforms. You've seen this on your homeworks. You saw this previously for Fourier series. It's basically the same thing. Uh, a real signal has what's called a Hermitian Fourier transform. Hermitian just means that it's basically even, but you have to just pay into account that if it's a complex number, uh, it has to equal its conjugate. Okay. An imaginary signal is anti-Hermitian, right? So it's, it's the same as even and odd to a degree, but now we just have to generalize it for complex numbers. So we have to take the conjugate on the right-hand side. 
So there are some other properties here, and you know, please feel free to review these properties. if they don't make sense. All right, so the previous slide was symmetries. And so here, now we're gonna talk about something we haven't talked about much in the lectures, which is properties of the Fourier transform itself. If you think about a signal or a system, we said that both signals, systems, they have properties, right? Uh, if, if you look at all the lectures we've been talking about, we define something like a signal, a system, or an operation like convolution, and then we say, well, these things have properties, right? Convolution was commutative, for example, right? Signals can be causal. Uh, similarly, the Fourier transform is an operator, and this operator has a lot of special properties, actually quite a lot. And we'll put some of these together at the end of the lecture and show how this uh, actually powers your car radio. Uh, but there's a list of about 11 or 12, uh, 11 uh, properties here some of which we've discussed to some degree, like Parseval's theorem. But in general, please review any proofs that we do not cover in lecture. You don't need to memorize them, but it's really helpful to check your understanding. We'll go through a few of them in today's lecture, starting with linearity, perhaps one of the most important ones. So linearity uh, is no different as it was for any other operator. Remember I just said that a Fourier transform, like this, this, uh, this F notation, you could almost think of this as a system. Right, instead of H, you can think of this as you know, a system F. And systems have this uh, property of linearity, and you can see that it's the exact same. So if you look at this definition here, this definition should look very similar to the linearity we discussed for systems, uh, which, I mean, where the only difference here is you, instead of having H, you have F, script F. And so what it's saying is that this, uh, linearity property is exactly the same. You have here, you have this scaling, so this is homogeneity, and over here you have superposition. Okay. So if we wanted to prove that indeed the Fourier transform has linearity as a check your understanding question. That the Fourier transform is linear. In other words, IE, you want to show that this thing holds. Okay, you want to show that this thing holds for all a and constants a and b that could possibly exist, as well as all possible signals f1 and f2. So if you are able to, feel free to pause the video and write down your proof to linearity uh, on your notepad. Okay, so feel free to pause the video and then rejoin us in a moment. Okay, welcome back. So uh, let's look at how we would prove this. In fact, it's actually pretty much uh, the same strategy as we usually use. We look at the left-hand side, and we're gonna kind of like work it like clay so that eventually we're gonna get something that looks like the right-hand side. So the first line of the proof is we're just gonna start with the left-hand side. The left-hand side is Okay, so that's the left-hand side, and this is gonna equal what? Is it gonna equal Well, the answer is yes, it's gonna eventually equal that, but we need to show that without using the property itself. So if we don't know the property of linearity, what we have to do is somehow we need to expand the left-hand side. 
So in order to do that, we're going to use our understanding of what the operator actually is, f. So f is actually, in reality, an integral transform. So here we break from the shorthand. And this integral transform plus b All right, so now you can see where the linearity is going to superposition, at least, is going to come in because we can split the integral. And this is nothing but okay. So if we look here, this last line is simply the right hand side. So we started with the left hand side, and then we kind of manipulated it to look like the right-hand side by explicitly writing out the integral transform. OK. Now, in general, linearity will extend to finite combinations. So for example, I could have a summation here. Uh, it doesn't need to be like superposition of two signals. I can have k signals that superimpose, and I can still have linearity. So that allows us to either have the Fourier transform operating on the sum of a lot of signals, or I could have the Fourier tra or I could have the sum of a lot of signals that have already been Fourier transformed. Um, where this kind of uh, makes sense is, let's say that uh, uh, computing a Fourier transform often takes resources. Can be done typically in log n time, right? Uh, n log n be done in n log n, where n is the length of your signal. So uh, I want to minimize the number of times I compute a Fourier transform. So what I can do in the left-hand side, I'm actually only computing the Fourier transform once. right? On the right-hand side, I'm actually computing the Fourier transform k times. So if you know mathematically that these two are equivalent, then you can find the optimal combination that uh, enhances your compute. OK, linearity is not just useful to enhance compute, but it can enable us to compute Fourier transforms better. Remember that uh, on your homeworks or in the last lecture, it was not a treat to go and compute the Fourier transform. right? You have to go and laboriously derive it and then write the integral. And remember, you have a complex exponential inside the integral, so it becomes a kind of a tricky integral. Now, if you understand these basic properties, then you can actually leverage them to essentially use the Fourier transform like Legos. Let me go through a concrete example so this makes more sense. Here we have a signal that looks kind of uh, a little bit more complicated than a simple rect function, right? It's like a staircase with two steps. So it steps up and then steps down. And let's say you're asked on an exam or a homework, what is its Fourier transform? Well, of course, you could go and compute the Fourier transform explicitly, but you could also use your properties of linearity. You know that this signal is actually the sum of two other signals. It's the sum of a rect function that looks like this and the sum of another rect function that looks like this. Right? So I essentially have uh, two rect functions that are adding up. So if I want to actually write out the signal f of t here is actually going to be equal to 1 half, right? Because this is 0.5. So it's going to be 1 half times the rect of t over 2. That gives me the purple signal. <clears throat> 
and the blue signal is going to be one half times the rect of t. Okay, so f of t is now just two rect functions added up. And so if I want to take the Fourier transform, I only need to take the Fourier transform of the superposition, which equals the Fourier transform of each one added up. So let's take a look at what that would look like. Remember that my equation now that I want a Fourier transform is not some complicated staircase, but it's just one half rect of t over two plus one half rect of t. And remember, this was the purple function from the previous slide, and this was the blue signal from the previous slide. Now, recall, we'll put it here. Recall that the Fourier transform of rect, remember that table that we talked about in the beginning of this lecture, rect of t over t, has a pair, Fourier transform pair, of t sinc omega t over 2 pi, right? This is the Fourier transform of a rect. So now I can simply just plug that in. So the Fourier transform, I want to calculate f of j omega, then that is simply 1 half times, okay, so let's plug this in. So capital T is 2, so it would be 2 times sinc of omega times 2 over 2 pi, all right? Plus, now I have to add up the blue guy. So in this case, capital T is just 1, so that becomes easy, it's, right? It's 1 half times 1 times sinc of omega times 1 over 2 pi. And so what I end up getting for my final answer is just the sinc of omega over pi plus 1 half times the sinc omega over 2 pi. And so here we were able to calculate the Fourier transform of that staircase without using any integrals. So that's a useful application of the linearity property. So here's just how that same calculation that we had for the Fourier transform looks. If I take that same Fourier transform I just calculated and I plot it in the frequency domain, this is what I get. Okay. Let's move on to our next property. The next property we're going to learn is time scaling. So remember, uh, just as a refresher, we were talking about the signals that could either contract or expand in time. So if I have a signal in the time domain, maybe it looks something like this. I don't know, right? Something like that. Well, if I want to contract it, I can squeeze it down, right? Let me draw this as a Gaussian just so it's easier to represent. So I have some signal in time and I can kind of squeeze it so I can contract it. And if I contract it, what I'm really doing is that if I have some f of t, right? So I can have this f of a t, where in this particular case, a is greater than one. So the signal is actually going to narrow down, all right? It's going to contract. Or I could also have a much wider signal when a is less than 1, but greater than 0. Okay. Let's just write a t here. And the black is A equals 1. So now what's an interesting property that holds is that if I know the Fourier transform of the black signal when A equals 1, uh, that could be like my baseline. 
then I can also tell you what the Fourier transform of the red and the blue signals are. And I can do that because I know this constant A that it's been scaled by in the time domain. And so then the Fourier transform is simply scaled as well uh, by, in the independent variable, it's divided by A. So you can see here it's divided by A. And then I've also scaled the amplitude in some way as well. OK, this is super cool. Uh, but let's intuitively look at this. Suppose that in this particular case, I'm going to choose some A that's greater than 1. OK, if A is greater than 1, then we kind of agreed that the signal in the time domain contracts. But let's look at what happens to the Fourier transform. In the Fourier transform, the independent variable here is 1 over A. Right here, it's f of a t. Here, it's f of omega over a. So whatever happens in the time domain, the opposite will happen in the Fourier domain when it comes to contraction and expansion. So therefore, if a is greater than 1, f of t contracts, but its Fourier transform expands. And vice versa, if a is between 0 and 1, then f of t will expand, but its Fourier transform will contract. So let's plot what the Fourier transform will look like. Here, we've plotted the time domain. Right, This is in time. So now let's plot what this might look like in the frequency domain. Okay. So in this particular case, I'm going to have my axis be omega. And so the blue signal, which is really fat in the time domain, is therefore going to be kind of the narrow guy when it comes to the frequency domain. And by contrast, the red signal okay, in in this particular example above is actually going to spread out. So what's, what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is that if I look, this is a low frequency, right? Omega is zero at the origin. So this blue sort of where it, it starts to get close to the, uh, close to zero or close to the horizontal axis, uh, that happens at a low value of omega, whereas the red signal gets low or close to the axis at a higher frequency. And that makes perfect sense because uh, this signal, the red signal, it, it's kind of clear visually that it has, it's made up of higher frequency sine waves. And it's super clear just visually in the time domain that this kind of slowly undulating uh, hill that you know is is barely um, a steep hill uh, is going to be made up of very low frequency sinusoids. Maybe if it's it's almost purely flat, right? So it's almost like the DC sinusoid. So intuitively, then you would imagine that the Fourier transform of this blue signal is only going to have low frequencies, and that's kind of what it has. It this Fourier transform of that blue slow hill doesn't really have any content up here. Right, doesn't have any high frequencies. So hopefully it makes intuitive sense. Uh, if not, feel free to post on Piazza or uh, send me an email. OK, so now we've explained this uh, time scaling property. So the next thing you might ask is, well, how do we prove the time scaling property? Uh, to show this, let's without loss of generality, let's consider a greater than zero. Uh, the proof is going to be the same, but we'll consider a greater than zero, enabling us to use a variable change. So what does that mean? So let's look at our uh, sort of equation here. What I want to show is I want to show this is my left-hand side, f of the Fourier transform of some scaled signal, right? And eventually, if I'm correct, this is, there's going to be a right-hand side here. Uh, this is going to equal 1 over A times F of J omega over A. So that was the property that we spoke about earlier, right? It's on the last slide. So I've removed the absolute value because we're only considering a positive A for the moment. Now, our goal here is to go from this green left-hand side 
to this purple left-hand side by working or manipulating like clay this integral. All right, so what you can do is as a check your understanding question, you can see if you can make the manipulations to go from green to the purple. All right, so feel free to pause the video and see if you can do that. As a hint, it'll be helpful to use variable change. Okay, very good. So as it turns out, uh, what we can do is first, let's define a change of variable. Let's define tau as being a t. That way we don't have to deal with a function with kind of two parameters in the independent variable, right? It'll just become f of tau instead of f of a t. And if we do that, then we also need to define d tau, and d tau is going to be a dt. So now let's plug that in and see what we get. If we plug this in, we get the integral of f of tau e to the minus j over a d tau over a. This is going to equal 1 over a. So we already see the 1 over a coming out of f of tau e to the minus j omega over a tau d tau. This is going to equal 1 over a. And let's take a look at what we have here. What we have here is, uh, it looks very similar to a Fourier transform. So we can do another change of variable. Let's say W prime, right? In this particular case, equals W omega over A. So it's actually omega, not W. Sorry about that. So omega prime equals omega over A. So uh, effectively, I'm projecting on a new frequency omega, it's like taking a Fourier transform, except instead of having omega over a, we can just replace that with omega prime. So then it's the exact same equation as we would have for a Fourier transform. And you can check that if you uh, have the previous slide handy. So therefore, this is simply the Fourier transform of j omega prime, all right? using that substitution. And if I then go and substitute back, I'm going to get 1 over a So omega prime, I'm going to go back to the substitution. Omega prime equals omega over a j omega over a, which is exactly the same as the right hand side. And so this completes the proof. All right, so let's look at a practical example of this. So if we know that, uh, so we know the Fourier transform of rect. So here, what we have here is we, so we know the Fourier transform of rect. This is given to us, it's something we derived in a previous lecture, right? Or it's in the handbook, it's in the catalog. So you have rect t of over t, capital T has a Fourier transform of capital T sinc omega t over 2 pi. So if you have this uh, Fourier transform that's been given to you, how would you get the Fourier transform of rect of t? Well, rect of t is simply a version of rect of t over capital T that's been scaled in the independent variable. So we can calculate this pretty easily, right? So let's look at rect of t. So rect of t is nothing but, if I remember, right, we had f of t and we have f of a t, 
So in this case, we can set A equal to capital T, okay? right? Because that's how I get from rective T over T, capital T, to rective lowercase t. So if we set A equals to T, then what we have is we have rect of t over t times a equals rect t times t. This equals 1 over t times t times the sink of omega over t times t over 2 pi, which equals the sink of omega over 2 pi. All right. And the way that we sort of got from here to here is we simply said that, OK, uh, this is just if A equals T, capital T, then I just need to take this Fourier transform here and I need to essentially go and uh, do, if I'm going to multiply, if I'm going to multiply here by T, I need to go and divide the independent variable by T here. So that's what I did. And then remember that we also have to scale the amplitude by one over T. And so that's how we got this magenta line to get here. And then we simply simplify to get sync of omega over two pi. So therefore, what this is saying is that if I have rect of t, I have another Fourier transform pair that I've just learned. The Fourier transform of just a rect of t is sync of omega over two pi. So now that's also in our catalog. Here's an example of really nailing down the intuition for the time scaling theorem. Let's consider a communications example where I have two pulses, two rect pulses. This could be fired from a LIDAR or, or you know, any other device. So I have two rect pulses, uh, rect of t and rect of t over 5. And so rect of t over 5 is shown in red. So in this particular example, rect of t over 5, uh, the height of this, by the way, is 1. Uh, takes about five seconds to read the pulse. Okay. So to transmit one bit, it takes five seconds. So you have effectively 0 0.2 bits per second, very slow. In contrast, the black rec function is transmitting one bit per second, and you have essentially one bit per second or 5x greater data transmission rate. Now, if you look at the Fourier transforms of these uh, two pulses, you see two different sinks, right? Because Fourier transform of rex is sink. By the way, people also called rex as uh, just, just offhand um, as boxcar functions. Okay, that's another name for rect. Uh, so Fourier transform, actually boxcar is usually what, uh, uh, when I went to the East Coast, uh, I did my undergrad in the West Coast, and I learned it as rect. And then I went to the East Coast, and everybody would call it boxcar. I don't know if it's an East or West thing, but that's just my experience. So uh, if I have a boxcar or a rect function, and you take the Fourier transform of that, then you're going to end up with a sink, as we have mentioned. The slow pulse, which is the red one, the one that takes, you know, has a slow data rate, will actually be, you know, concentrated at low frequencies. So it's only in the low frequency range here. Whereas the faster pulse is going to be more spread out in the frequency domain. So in general, the width of the spectrum, uh, however you define it, we can talk, we'll talk more concretely, maybe towards the end of the class of how you define width. It's, uh, but essentially I can define it as maybe I take the, I take the, the first minimum, uh, the closest minima to the origin, and I look at the distance between them. So this is called the bandwidth B. Uh, 
and here is your other signal, and this is your bandwidth B prime. Right? In this particular case, B prime is greater than B. So a shorter pulse is going to have a larger bandwidth. And this is the same example that we saw earlier with that um, uh, blue and um, I forgot what other color we used. But um, it's the same example we saw here with the blue and the red signal. It's effectively the same example. So when someone talks about the bandwidth of a communication system being, hey, I have the super high bandwidth communication system, what that's effectively telling you is it's telling you what the shortest pulse you can send in time is. Somebody says, uh, you know, people used to talk about having uh, high bandwidth laser communications for space applications. High bandwidth laser comms. So if you say, hey, I've invented a high bandwidth laser comm, what you're effectively saying is that you figured out a way to have some laser and shoot a very short duration pulse in time. Right, so that's what uh, the analog is. Okay. So uh, time scaling is one property. Related to time scaling is time shifting. Okay. Uh, here, instead of multiplying the independent variable, we're going to add or subtract a shift to the independent variable as shown on this slide. So in this particular example, what we have is we have Okay, uh, so I think my Zoom just froze. Let's hope that it's still recording. And I'm gonna reshare the iPad. Great. All right, so we just talked about um, time scaling where we multiplied the independent variable. Now let's talk about time shifting where we're gonna actually shift the independent variable by some constant. So the definition of time shifting means that if I take my signal F and I go and shift it, what does that tell me about the Fourier transform of the output? Well, what it actually tells me is it tells me that the output Fourier transform is scaled by a complex exponential. It's multiplied by a complex exponential. So this is known as modulation and we'll cover this later. But for now, uh, let's not worry about the practical applications. Let's try to prove this, uh, at least on this slide. So uh, how do I prove this? Well, what I want to do is I want to prove that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. So we've talked a lot about this strategy. So why don't you go ahead uh, as a check your understanding question and see if you can offer a proof of this property. Feel free to pause the video and then rejoin us on the flip side. Hey, uh, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, hopefully you've now rejoined us. And how would you prove this? Well, the first thing we would do is we would write out the left-hand side of this, okay? So we're gonna write out the left-hand side. Oops. And so the left-hand side here, Sorry guys, my internet keeps dropping. 
Okay, so we're gonna start with the left-hand side and we're essentially gonna go through the intermediate multiplications to kind of shape it like clay so it looks like the right-hand side. So how do we do that? Well, let's first write it in integral form. And in order to do this, uh, what we're gonna use is black and we should end up with the following. So let's see, so we have this T minus tau, which is uh, kind of annoying. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna define a tau prime equals T minus tau. Therefore, D tau prime equals, in this particular case, DT, and T is gonna equal uh, tau prime plus T. Tau prime uh, plus T. All right, very good. So now what I can do is I can use this substitution, which I'll write in fuchsia to get F of T prime, sorry, tau prime, E to the minus J omega, uh, lowercase t is gonna become tau prime plus T, and then DT is just gonna become D tau prime, right? So now if I've used those substitutions, I can simply uh, look at this integral. And now that I've moved the shifted variable to the complex exponential, we know that we can very easily break complex exponentials. So that was our logic of uh, using the integral substitution. So if we wanna break the complex exponential, we simply need to uh, remove the e to the minus j omega uh, you know, uh, uh, t here. So in this particular case, what I can do is uh, E integral of minus infinity to infinity F of tau prime e to the minus j omega tau prime d tau prime equals okay so there's a slight typo here let me find that. So when I substituted the T, this should really be, this should have been a tau, right? T equals tau prime plus tau. So this should be tau prime plus tau. So this becomes E to the minus J omega tau. And what we see is that this is nothing but the Fourier transform, capital F. So this is F of J omega multiplied by E to the minus J omega tau. All right, and so now we have actually gotten back to what I wanted, which was the blue right-hand side there. Okay, so this is a quick proof of the time shifted signal. Uh, the mistake I made when doing this derivation, just in case, was I wrote down t equals tau prime plus t, and that kind of threw off the derivation. It should be t equals tau prime plus tau. Okay, so now we have the derivation of a time shifted signal. We now move on to another property of Fourier transforms a very, very important property. And we're gonna take this whole slide for this property. This property is called the convolution theorem. It's, you know, when we talked about LTI systems, we said that they're really important because LTI systems allow you to put 
you know, uh, to characterize the output for any type of input, if you just know the impulse response, that was really half the story. The other half of why LTI systems are so amazing is this thing called the convolutional theorem. The convolution theorem uh, enables us to do, so convolution is really hard to do, as you've seen on your exam or your homeworks. Uh, but the convolution theorem gives us a shortcut so we can avoid doing convolution. Um, and because convolution is so important, it, it really means that we have an easy way to do any LTI operations straightforward. So we don't need to worry about the impulse response integral if we're using the convolution theorem as much. So let's look at it. So let's say that lowercase f1 and 2 are signals with associated Fourier transforms capital F1 and 2. Then the Fourier transform of the, of the convolution of the signals equals the Fourier transform, the product of the Fourier transforms. Uh, stated simply, convolution in time is multiplication in the frequency domain. So let's look at this in kind of like an applications context. Uh, this might make more sense than just symbols. Let's say I have some x going in to a system that we know is LTI. So we have x, and let's even make it, let's put the time domain, x of t goes in to a system h of t to give me some output y of t. So in this particular case, uh, what the convolution, what I know about the output of y of t is that y of t equals x of t convolved with h of t. All right, so we know this from the previous lecture. However, there's an easier way to get to y. What we can say is that we know that x has a Fourier transform, right? Capital X of omega or j omega. And h also has a Fourier transform. And y also has a Fourier transform. Now, let's draw this dividing line here that divides time and frequency domain. So here I have time domain, and here I have frequency domain. So in the frequency domain, uh, all I've done now is I've just said each of these signals has a Fourier transform, which is pretty much true, right? We know that pretty much any signal that's well behaved has a Fourier transform, so nothing here that we've done is uh, new or revolutionary. But what the convolution theorem says is that x times h, right, is going to equal capital Y. So in, in the time domain, it was x convolved with h gives you y. In the Fourier domain, it's x times h gives you capital Y. So now what I can do is if I want to calculate the output of an LTI system, if I just want to trace this, you know, I start with my input signal, I then go and then I Fourier transform it. Then I multiply it with the Fourier transform of the impulse response. That gets me to the output, Y, and then I inverse Fourier transform it back to get lowercase y, or in other words, this convolution equation. But I don't need to actually calculate it. So I've kind of beat around the bush, right? This step here, if this convolution is in red, right? This step here would be convolution. But I've gone and literally beaten around the bush to get to y. Now, why does this make sense? Well, we know that Fourier transforms are quote unquote easy, right? Every signal has its Fourier transform, and you can just compute that with, uh, uh, you know, you have a table or a catalog of known Fourier transforms, and many signals fall into that. If not, you can use a computer. So you have these Fourier transforms. So all these things are easy to go from time to frequency. So then all you need to do in the frequency domain is multiply. And this is a really easy operation to do as compared to convolution, especially in high dimensions. You might have multidimensional convolutions, which then become really hard even for computers to do. All right, so the convolution theorem is super, super important. So we're also going to spend a little bit of time trying to prove it. Okay. So how would we do that? 
Well, one way to do that is uh, to just write out what the convolutional theorem is saying. It's saying that on the left-hand side, the Fourier transform of F1 convolved with F2 is going to hopefully at some point after some manipulations, we're going to want that to equal capital F2 j omega times capital F1 of j omega. So now if this is if what we have on the left hand side is green or we'll call the right hand side green and the left hand side red the goal is to get from red to green okay. so the first step in that intermediate manipulations right going from red to green this is the convolutional theorem that was stated on the last slide so it's just been given to you now we want to prove that this holds so the very first thing that we do is we go and uh apply the explicit operator for f, right? It's not enough to just say you have f. Let's at least explicitly write out the integral transform. So in this particular case, because of um, uh, it's the Fourier transform of a convolution, you're going to have two integrals. You're going to have one integral for convolution and one integral for the Fourier transform. So in this particular case, this is your convolution. So you're going to have your convolution here. And then you're going to have your Fourier transform integral on the outside, right? So you have these two integrals. And so what you can do is you can actually separate them out. So what we can do is we can write out, and we'll use red for the Fourier transform integral. We're going to have minus infinity to infinity of f1 of tau. All right, so all I've done here is I've just moved it. Uh, and I'm going to have d tau here. I'm just going to swap the order of t and tau. And then in orange, we're going to have integral minus infinity to infinity of f2 of t minus tau e to the minus j omega t dt. Okay. So what I've done is I've split it into the variables that only depend on t. And that allows me to move f1 of tau to the outside. Right? f1 of tau does not depend on t. So I can move it to the outside of the orange integral. And what this enables me to do is it enables me to write down this as integral minus infinity to infinity of f1 of tau. And all I need to do now is compute this orange guy. So if I want to compute the orange guy, uh, let's look at the orange guy. The orange guy is uh, the Fourier transform of a shifted version of f2, right? And if we remember our time shifting property, The Fourier transform of F2 ordinarily is capital F2 j omega. But because it's been shifted by some amount, it's actually going to be F2 times e to the minus j omega tau. Okay. d tau. Now, if I look at this, allow me to go and just swap this order. I'll just swap this order so it looks a little cleaner and better connects to the Fourier transform. You'll see in a moment. So it's just multiplication, which is commutative. So I'm just going to swap that. So e to the minus j omega tau times f2 of j omega. Right. Now, what do we have? Well, if I look here, uh, this segment here is nothing but the Fourier transform. Okay. So what I can do is I can write out 
the following equation. I can write out capital F2, J omega, move it outside the integral, times this yellow guy here, F1 of J omega. And that's exactly what I wanted to get to. So that completes the proof of the convolution theorem. Here's an example of using the convolution theorem in action. Let's say you want to compute the Fourier transform of the unit triangle. Unfortunately, we don't have the unit triangle in our catalog right now. So we don't have it in our catalog and we don't want to go and do a laborious calculation. So what do we do? Well, remember that the triangle function triangle of t is actually equal to the convolution of the rect. Okay, rect convolved rect. So the Fourier transform of this can now just be calculated, right? If I want to calculate the Fourier transform of triangle, then it's going to equal the Fourier transform of rect times the Fourier transform of rect, right? Because this is convolution. So convolution in time is multiplication in the frequency domain. So let me go ahead and convert this to the frequency domain. And in the frequency domain, I'll use a, a different color. I'll use the color uh, purple. So now let's put it in the frequency domain. So this is now in the frequency domain. And this is going to equal, in the frequency domain, it's convolution in time. So it's going to be the Fourier transform of rect of t times the Fourier transform of rect of t. Okay. And so remember that the Fourier transform of rect of t was what? We'll just put it in green here for reference. We said that the rect of t has the following pairing. The Fourier transform of rect is sinc of omega over 2 pi. So therefore, this quantity is simply sinc of omega over 2 pi squared. Right? And if you want to just write this compactly, you can also equally write, just like sine squared, you can write sinc squared omega over 2 pi. So this is an example of how we have computed the Fourier transform of the triangle. And now we have this in our catalog. OK, in general, the Fourier transform has this desirable property of duality as well. I'll let you kind of read the slide offline a little bit, but it's actually saying something very simple in a little bit of a complicated way. Basically, what it's saying is that every Fourier transform pair, remember that it's no coincidence that when we did like rect, um, you know, that when we, when we had like, uh, some rect, and then we said the Fourier transform of rect is a sink. We, we didn't just go and say rect sink, right? We drew these, we were very careful to draw this double arrow. And what that double arrow tells us is that it's kind of like a, a bidirectional statement. It also means that the Fourier transform of sink is rect. That's what it means. So what this slide is saying is that there's a correction factor of 2 pi uh, involved here. But what it's effectively saying is that if I take the Fourier transform, and there actually should not be a j here. So what it's effectively saying is that the Fourier transform, if I replace the omega, j omega in the Fourier transform with t, then the Fourier transform is equal, or it has a bidirectional relationship with the time domain function evaluated at the frequencies omega. Okay. So here as an exercise, CYU, uh, please feel free 
to cover up this derivation on the slide and then prove this. Okay, so here's some examples of duality in action. Um, if I have rect of t, then I know that rect of t, just from uh, a few slides ago, that rect of t is going to give me sync of omega over 2 pi. So if I had a sync in the frequency domain, uh, if, if I had a, a rect function in the time domain, that would be a sync in the frequency domain. So then you might ask, well, if it's bidirectional, what if I had a sync in the time domain? Well, if you had a sync in the time domain, then you would absolutely have a rect in the frequency domain. And that's what the duality tells us. Similarly, if you have a causal exponential, right? So you have here a causal exponential. We have a causal exponential in the time domain. And that gives us this one over a plus j omega in the frequency domain. Now, what if I had this guy in the time domain? Would I get back a causal exponential? Yes, I would. I would have absolutely a causal exponential in the frequency domain. So in general, uh, a couple take home points here are first of all, that Sorry, my phone is really on the fritz here. Um, so a couple take home points here are that if we have a uh, duality, um, then what that means is that convolution in the time domain is multiplication in the frequency domain. Now, duality means that multiplication in the time domain is convolution in the frequency domain. So remember that when we introduced the convolution theorem, we were assuming a scenario where x goes into an LTI system to give you y, and this was in time. Now, it's possible that in time, you might have a different system. It might not be, uh, uh, it might be some other system that you're dealing with in, in science and engineering. It just so happens that it gives you x times h to give you y. Right, this is like a mixer, for example, for modulation and radio. So you have a multiplication in time. Now we don't have a system signals and systems model. We just have a straight, a straight up multiplication of two functions. So what, what becomes interesting in this duality case is that the same idea from convolutional theorem also works. So if I have multiplication in time, then in frequency, this is going to be the Fourier transform of x, right? But it's going to be a convolution of the Fourier transform Paris to give you capital Y. So as an exercise, you're welcome to go and see if you can prove it. And the proof, again, is very similar to the time domain proof. All right, so let's maybe get to a concrete example of you putting these properties together which uh, if it didn't make sense before in the lecture, feel free to rewatch it. But at least for me, I kind of learned better with applications. So we'll move towards an application of how we can ap apply these duality properties. So uh, let's say for the sake of argument that I have a shifted signal in time. A shifted signal in time is gonna be a multiplication in the frequency domain of the original Fourier transform with the complex exponential. Right? This is one of the properties that we learned earlier. Now, if we were to use duality uh, to, to look study this, we could ask ourselves, well, instead of this, what would have happened if the time domain signal was multiplied by a complex exponential? So imagine that instead of shifting it in time, I actually went ahead and multiplied it directly by a complex exponential in time. Uh, this is similar to what you do. So this is like a delay, right, in time of a signal. This is like a radio, how a radio works, radio transmitter. Doesn't delay, it modulates. So this is modulation. So we'll call that radio modulation. So now I can use a duality property to understand how radio modulation is going to affect my signal, right? Because I know that this is a reciprocal pair. Complex exponential multiplied by a signal is going to give me a shifted version. Then by duality, I can tell you that if I go and multiply in time, 
I'm going to end up with a shifted signal in the frequency domain. And that's exactly what I get. I get the shifted signal right here. So in other words, uh, sort of the TLDR here is that I didn't tell you a priori that multiplying a time domain signal with a complex exponential is going to give you a shifted Fourier transform. I did not give you this property. But I gave you the dual of this property, which is in general that if I had delayed in time, that I would have multiplied by complex exponential and frequency. I didn't give you this property, but I gave you the dual, and you were able to get to this property. And using the dual, you were able to nicely arrive at this property. So in this particular example, uh, we're going to go one layer deeper, and we're going to break the complex exponential using linearity to actually show that we can split it into cosines or sines. This is uh, just for application context. It's not super important uh, to duality. What it's important to is the application we're going to show, which is how an AM radio works. Because in the real world, we're not usually multiplying signals by complex exponentials because it's a, got imaginary parts. We're actually multiplying by cosines and sines. So let's look at this neat derivation above and see how it's modified if we instead, instead of multiplying by complex exponential, which we're doing here, instead of doing this, let's multiply by a straight up cosine. So if we multiply the signal by a straight up cosine, what we see is that the Fourier transform, it actually looks very similar. It has this component here, but it also has omega plus omega naught. And so you can derive this in a number of ways uh, if you like uh, offline. But basically, it comes with uh, these sort of two extra uh, Fourier transforms. It comes with a, a shifted Fourier version of Fourier transform by minus omega naught and another shifted version by plus omega naught. So what does that look like graphically? Well, let's say that uh, I have this plot in the frequency domain. This is omega. So I have this plot in the frequency domain, and I have this nice you know, Fourier transform just hanging around here. I don't know, it's some sort of Fourier transform that I had of original signal. Pretend this was like a radio broadcast. Um, it's a radio broadcast of a song, which might have a Fourier transform that looks something like this. Now, what I'm gonna do is in the time domain of that song, I'm gonna actually multiply it by a cosine, which is what it's gonna do is it's gonna, I'm going to multiply by cosine at omega naught, and, uh, and, and therefore I'm going to see these two sort of peaks uh, in, the, in the Fourier transform. What I'm going to really do is I'm going to actually take this Fourier transform, I'm going to scale it by one half, and I'm going to center it here, and I'm going to center it here. This is almost like taking this Fourier transform and convolving it with two Dirac's, right? So I'm going to convolve the blue signal with the red signal, which as we said for Dirac convolution, it's like pick and place. So I'm going to pick up that uh, you know, blue curve and then uh, pop it so it centers up on the uh, two spikes. So I'm effectively taking the Fourier transform of a cosine and convolving it with the, the blue signal. Okay. So I'm actually doing the convolution not in the time domain. I'm doing the convolution in the frequency domain. So this idea is called modulation. It's different from what you learned in the signals and systems where we had this canonical x goes into h to give you y. That was one particular view. Now I'm going to take x and I'm just going to multiply it by some other signal. x times some h equals y. All right. So it's going to be a little bit of a different model here. OK. So. You know, we can prove this result if we wanted to pretty easily. I think uh, you guys are probably getting tired of all the proofs. But if you like, you can go ahead and try to prove the modulation result. So feel free to do this at home. Now, what I really want to get to is this idea of uh, how an AM radio kind of works. So let's think about it for a moment. Uh, AM radio is called amplitude modulation radio. We all have uh, this AM radio in our cars. Uh, some of you may be quite young. Uh, maybe all the cars are uh, use satellite radio or something different. But um, 
back in the day, you would have these towers and these towers would be sending uh, radio waves at some frequency, like some centered frequency, like for example, uh, 880 kilohertz would be like one radio station. And at 880 kilohertz, you would hear a nice song. Uh, and if you wanted to, got bored of that song and you wanted to change the station, then you might have changed it and you might hear, change it to something like 920 kilohertz. And that gives you a different station. So this is radio station one. And then station number two. And we'll use a different color for this. Okay. So these are kind of actual numbers that you might pick uh, for radio station frequencies. And if you look, they're about 40,000 hertz apart, right? These two stations. These are two next door stations, station one and station two. Why is that? Well, let's, uh, let's think about that uh, a bit more. So just as an aside, as a context, your human ear has a bandwidth of 20,000 hertz. You can hear from about 20 hertz, let's just call it zero hertz to keep the math simple. So you can hear a frequency that's DC all the way up to 20,000 hertz. Okay, so there are three ways that we've discussed to modulate a signal. We could multiply by complex exponential, we can multiply by a cosine, or we can multiply by a sine. In this particular case, just for the sake of argument, to keep everything simple, we're gonna ignore this and ignore this. Let's just say that we wanna have our modulation strategy to be multiplication by a cosine. This is the typical uh, modulation scheme because mixers and you know, you're not gonna generate a complex exponential in your hardware. That's gonna be harder to do. You're gonna generate a nice simple cosine tone, for example. Uh, and the reason you do cosine also is because it's the real part of the complex exponential. It makes a lot of the math easier to model things as cosines. So when, when it comes to uh, you know, deciding between whether you want to model it with cosine or sine, you would also still pick cosine, generally, just to keep the math easier because uh, when we do Euler's, cosine is in the real part. Okay, then, uh, so you're going to have some signal f of t. What is f of t? f of t is your song, okay? f of t is your song in the time domain. Uh, your song could be something like, here's an orchestra playing, and then here's the loud crescendo, and then they're quiet, and so on. It's some signal, and then it varies, and they have exciting parts here. They have this big drum beat that comes at the very end. Whatever, right? This is your song in the time domain. It's some like squiggly signal. Uh, you want to go and you want to measure this signal. Now, this song, uh, this song, this is the loudness, it's like the voltage is function of time. This song has frequencies from 20 to 20,000 hertz, right? At most, the song is, uh, has instruments that play at 20,000 hertz uh, because any other instrument would be like a dog whistle to humans. So you would just use up to 20,000 hertz. So what are some ways that we could transmit that signal to you sitting uh, sitting on the street, you know, you listening to the radio, what are some ways we could transmit that, that song? Uh, well, one way is to simply just play it on the speaker really loudly without modulation. So I could just send you f of t times one. I could just emit a speaker that emits f of t times one. Now, the problem with this is that f of t has like instruments and stuff like that that are playing sound. And these frequencies don't transmit well. Sound is not a good medium to transmit these frequencies. Uh, so you say, okay, let's use a different medium like radio waves to transmit these frequencies. But that's also a problem because these frequencies are too low to generate. They're, they're not optimal in terms of propagating through media. So what you do is you wanna go and you want to shift the spectrum to higher frequencies that will transmit nicely through the air. It turns out that's, that you know, frequent radio waves around 800 kilohertz or so uh, 
they transmit really nicely, like a thousand kilohertz radio wave. It goes through trees, bushes, and stuff like that, uh, bridges, tunnels, and everything to, to come and reach you, um, which other radio waves don't. So you take F of T and then you multiply it by a cosine or do modulation to get it up, to get it up to uh, uh, the signal. And this signal is called a carrier signal. Right. So I take my information signal, which is the song F of T, which is at a low frequency, and then I modulate it with a very high frequency carrier signal. And if I do that, then, and take the Fourier transform of this, then my output is two separate Fourier transforms uh, at minus omega centered at minus omega naught and omega naught. So let's see what that would look like. Let's make a plot here. So this is in the frequency domain omega. And I'm gonna have this song. For this particular song, it's gonna be a really boring song. All the song is gonna be in the time domain is it's gonna be a song playing a sync, okay? Uh, so the song is gonna be, actually let's make the song, let's make the song a sync squared, okay? So sync squared of T is kind of what my acoustic waveform looks like, just for the sake of argument. So if I have the sync squared of T, then what that's gonna mean is that in the frequency domain, this song is gonna look like a triangle. So this is ordinarily what the song would look like. So this is station one. So let's put this in blue. So station one plays sync squared. Uh, station two is, you know, let's say station two is a little bit uh, uh, more conventional. So they play a regular sync. Okay, they play a regular sync. Now this one actually looks closer to sync squared, but Right, so this is sync squared and this is sync of t. So station two, and I'll just put this in magenta, plays sync of t. So I have two really boring songs going on, but it, they have also really simple Fourier transforms. So in the Fourier domain, station two looks like this. So now if I had a detector that was measuring at the baseband, meaning that it was measuring uh, acoustics waves from minus 20 K Hertz to 20 K Hertz, that's not good because the magenta and the green overlap. So ignoring this uh, propagation distance of bushes and trees and, and not being able to mechanically send these sounds very far, um, it still doesn't work because these, the, the blue and the, and the magenta, the green and the magenta overlap. So now the two stations have muddied their songs. So what we're going to do is we're going to modulate these two stations differently at different frequencies. So let's look at the green station, right? The, the, uh, so we, we said blue, right? So the blue station is here and the magenta station is here. Okay. So let's look at these two stations and see what would happen if we modulated them. Let's start with the triangle, which is the blue station. I'm gonna put the blue station at 880 kilohertz. So what that means, if I multiply the sound from the station by a cosine at 880 kilohertz, what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna have, here I'm gonna have 880 kilohertz, and I'm gonna actually center, it's gonna be convolution with a Dirac here. So I'm actually gonna center one half of the triangle here and the other half at minus 880, okay? So here's your um, sort of stations. Now the triangle, uh, the, uh, sorry, the rect function is gonna be centered at a different frequency, maybe 920. So 920, would be right about 
you know, here or so, right? It's centered at 920 and minus 920. So uh, you can see that we've picked exactly a 40 kilohertz difference between them so that these signals don't overlap. And so this is an example of how we can create an AM radio that modulates uh, your signal. We basically take the signal, multiply it by a high frequency cosine, and it takes the Fourier transform and shifts it to a very high frequency. And then when we have a receiver, uh, we haven't talked about demodulation, but there's also this idea of demodulation, which we'll talk about later, which allows us to go and selectively have a sensor that is only sensitive to certain frequencies. So for example, if my sensor is only sensitive to frequencies from 880, between 860 and 900, right? If it's only sensitive to this window, I'm only gonna pick up the, the, the sync squared station. Uh, and the AM radio dial allows you to actually change the sliding window and slide it to different uh, pl places in the Fourier transform. So here's another example, right, uh, with a, a better plot. You have a rect signal here that carries your information. This is your song in the time domain. It's a very boring song in the time domain. It's just like a binary song. Everything is quiet and everything is loud. But uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to transmit that information. So we're, we still want to send that information at some frequency omega naught. And it turns out that this frequency that I want to send it at is 30 pi. So remember, omega equals 2 pi f, right? So 30 pi equals 2 pi f. So what is f? f is about 15 hertz. So in this particular case, it's not a super fast signal, but just to give you a sense of the argument, we're going to modulate this at 15 hertz. And so what that's going to do is it's going to take your sync function. This is your original Fourier transform. And I'm going to go and take one half of that, scale it down by one half, and place it at 15 hertz, and place the other half at minus 15 hertz. Okay. So now you, get, you can get a sense of why different radio stations use different frequencies. They can transmit whatever they like. It doesn't need to be a boring rec function, but it's only going to be isolated or centered around that specific frequency that they like. Uh, this is something called spectrum allocation, where the FCC, Federal Communications, they actually very carefully control uh, the frequencies that radio stations, Wi-Fi routers, cell phones can transmit their information signals on. And so a big problem uh, in society is actually something called spectrum all allocation, uh, where we are actually running out of spectrum. Uh, to give to companies like different you might have like a thousand or a million radio stations right the number of radio stations keeps increasing but we only have so many frequencies that your receiver can detect so that becomes a problem of spectrum allocation and you'll see that actually uh, when you have too many radio stations some of them are prohibited from transmitting at certain hours that's why if you listen to radio at like midnight or two in the morning you will actually hear a different radio station on that same frequency because they've been allocated that frequency at off-peak hours. Okay, so that concludes the uh, new content in this lecture. Uh, in office hours today, we went over a homework question. So I think in the interest of fairness, it's probably wise to go ahead and do that same question here. So the question was, uh, if you look at number three, in your homework assignment. Oops. Um, okay. All right. So if you look at number three in your homework assignment, CYU, look at uh, question 3D. And so question 3D, what it's asking you to do is you're given a signal. You're given some signal in the time domain. 
Okay, so you have x of t that's been given to you, and it basically looks like this trapezoid. Okay, this height is one, and this is minus three, this is three, and this is two, this is two, minus two. All right, so given x of t, uh, can I compute? So given knowledge of x of t, is it possible to evaluate uh, manipulations of the Fourier transform? So in particular, 3D is asking you to express the integral of minus infinity to infinity of e to j omega capital X of j omega d omega. Okay, so you're supposed to express this quantity without explicitly computing capital X of j omega. So how do you do that? Well, if we look at this expression, just look at it, it looks very similar to taking the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform, right? It looks super similar to taking the inverse Fourier transform of capital X which should give me lowercase x. So let's take a look at what that would look like. Let's write down how to get back from lowercase x from capital X. This equals one over two pi times the integral minus infinity to infinity of x of j omega e to j omega t d omega. Okay. Now, if I look at this, there are only two differences here. Uh, or a few, right? The first is uh, if I wanted to compute, sorry, this should be a negative sign here in the question. So here the exponent has a different sign, right? And there's no time term in the exponent. So we need to fix that problem. So one solution is to take x of t and let's evaluate it at negative one. If I do that, then this is what I get. T becomes negative one. So I get e to the minus j omega, d omega. So now it's almost the same as this expression. So if I didn't have this factor of one over two pi, all I would do is I would compute x of t evaluated at negative one. So x of negative one. x of negative one is one. However, I have this one over two pi here, which I don't have in the question. So what I need to do is I just need to multiply both sides by two pi. So two pi times x of t evaluated at negative one equals two pi times one over two pi. That's just gonna become one, right? So this equals integral of minus infinity to infinity x of j omega e to the minus j omega d omega. So if I look, this right-hand side exactly matches the function I want to compute. And I can compute that by multiplying x of t evaluated at negative 1 times 2 pi. This is, if I just look at this plot, x of negative 1 is 1. So 2 pi times 1 is 2 pi. So your answer to this question should be 2 pi. Okay, another question that came up in office hours was an interesting one. The integral of e to the j omega t, you know, you can have a minus there if you want, dt equals what? What does this integral equal? This is a very, very nice, you know, very special question. It's not an easy integral that you can compute by hand, you know, taking over minus infinity to infinity. But uh, if you try to work it out, I think you'll get some really nice intuition. So in a future lecture, we'll kind of go over this. All right, uh, thanks so much for your attention and see you next time.